Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 9 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Come on now, don't let a little constructive criticism get you down. You're all doing great. In fact, in fact, you are my best students. <gasps> We're your only students and still the best. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Four. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Odd New, which is Undo Backwards. The release date was December 2nd, 2021. The in-episode dates are May 13th through 14th. The writer was Jake Baumgart. The director was Christina Soda. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week is Tom Adcox as Clarion. Usman Ally as Khalid Nasur. Troy Baker as Henry Fife and Blue Devil. Uh, Daniela Bavadia as Andy Murphy. Erica Ishii as Mary Bromfeld and Child. David Kay as Vandal Savage and Vander Edge. Yuri Lowenthal as Zviad Bazovi and the Trogawogs. Cree Summer as Madame Xanadu. Lauren Tom as 13. And my favorite, uh, D.B. Woodsai as Phantom Stranger and Marvin Fargo. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens at the dawn of time, with an unknown narrator explaining how the Lords of Chaos and Order were born at the start of the universe, and how their elemental struggle maintains the balance of all creation. Then, after the credits, we see Thirteen, Holid, and Mary, Zatanna's magical protégés, battling a bunch of gremlins wreaking havoc in Manhattan. After the Trogawogs are successfully contained, it's revealed that this was all just a training exercise set forth by Zatanna, who gives the group some constructive criticism, but assures them that they're all doing well and are in fact her best and only students. I'm sure this will not come up later. At that exact moment, one of the Chaos Lords that's been relaxing somewhere in deep space breaks off from the pack and travels to Earth where it knocks out power in New York City and sends a shockwave that's felt by magic users across the globe, including Dr. Fate. During a Zoom meeting of the light, we're informed that Dr. Jace is still hard at work in Markovia, doing nothing wrong, I'm sure, activating metagenes as more and more meta-refugees flee into the country, and when that magical shockwave hits Clarion, he freaks out and teleports out of the call. Gotta go. See you, bye. <laughs> In a flashback, we learn that thousands of years ago, Vandal Savage founded a village for his metahuman descendants to live in peace, but that Clarion appeared and murdered everyone. Back in the present, Zatanna and her protégés take flying carousel animals across the city to investigate the magical surge by meeting with Madame Xanadu and are almost hit by a strangely familiar bus along the way. Meanwhile, that Lord of Chaos diamond we saw earlier breaks into a jewelry store, transforms a even larger diamond into a creature that can act as her anchor on the mortal plane, and manifests herself in the form of a young girl. The Chaos Lord names the creature Flaw and adopts the name Child for herself, before brutally murdering a security guard barely off scene. And over at the Premier Building, Blue Devil attempts to check in on a struggling Garfield, who assures him that he's doing just fine. And we all believe him. <laughs> Meanwhile, back with Zatanna's Academy of Magical Teenagers, uh, Madame Xanadu, who is now actually the greatest seer and medium on Earth since the last time we saw her back in season one, helps teleport the group to the last known location of the magic surge's source, which happens to be a very gross jewelry store crime scene that we'll get to. <laughs> In flashback, we see that after slaughtering an entire village, Clarion apparently repeatedly killed Vandal Savage 300 times for fun uh, be before the two struck a deal. Back in the present, the Magic Scouts are trying to figure out what could have done all of this only for Clarion to appear and threaten to kill everyone in the present, too. <laughs> An intense magical battle ensues, but is interrupted when Child summons Clarion to Roanoke Island. 
In our final scene, we learn that the narration we've been hearing in flashbacks was actually being delivered by the Phantom Stranger to Vandal Savage himself as a reminder of his past dealings with the Lord of Chaos, which he must keep in mind for what's to come. And over the credits, we see Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy just relaxing on a public bench watching Space Trek 3016 and eating snacks like everything is totally fine. That was a very confusing scene for me. This for, is a very back confusing on, episode for many of us. Uh-huh. Uh, they're back. They're back on Earth. That's are they in the future? Are they in the past? Where are they? What's happening? Also, what's happening in the main plot? And also, what's happening in the flashback plot? Uh, totally. Better nice. question. What form are the chicken whizzies in today? <laughs> Freeze dried. I think they were pretty crunchy. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Emily, do you have any thoughts on Vandal Savage? (laughs) (laughs) How are you feeling about Vandal Savage today? Okay, we're going to start off with Emily's negative note about this episode and this arc. And that's that I don't really care about Vandal Savage. I get what this episode is trying to do. And I get that it is trying to set up like larger historic and larger world conflict things that we will possibly see come up later in the season in some form or another. You would assume, based on if we're talking about them, they have to be some kind of important. But I personally don't care that much about Vandal Savage. I care about all of our other main and supporting characters, I care about their interpersonal relationships. I care about the plots that are affecting them. And then the show goes, hey, so several thousand years ago, this guy did some stuff. And I'm like, can we can we get back to Zatanna? I, I care about Zatanna. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just and it's one of those things where I get what they're going for, but I don't know. If it it doesn't really resonate with me, and I don't know if there is a better way it could have been handled. I almost feel like this is a story I would have enjoyed more as like a tie-in comic or something that was like not separate from the show, but not happening in the middle of an arc where I am trying to focus on like this set of characters. But I don't know. That's just kind of my feeling. I kind of get that. I think. I think some of discussion of it for the rest of the arc was probably tucked in crashing the mode, maybe. Yes. But like, yeah, I could see that. I'm fascinated by Vandal Savage's background and ever since last season's stuff. So I don't know. I'm interested. Well, I mean, in the first 30 seconds, you established that the the entire universe is 16 billion years old right uh and it only restarted because last time around uh the chaos and order just couldn't get along um or at least follow the rules so it blew up the previous universe right also there's there's technically 16 of them but then later in the episode there's there's more crystals so that's it i'm done i i I don't have more information there, <laughs> so I'm just going to leave that where it is. At the start of this universe, it seems that maybe there were 16, um, and later on when Child comes down, uh, there appear to be more crystals on both sides. Uh, does someone just like casually get an upgrade along the way? I'm like, yay, I've done it. But the most interesting part of about the Vandal story for me is that you're reverse engineering a lot of the magic we've seen to really say that it's all from the same place. Because as soon as they start doing anything, you have Zatanna using the backward speech, which Clarion has referred to as baby magic. So then what's adult magic? And then you have 13 who's technically using bad luck or probability magic in conjunction with urban magic. While at the same time, Mary is using the ley lines that are around her while invoking Greek gods. And then Khalid almost seems like he's tapping into the green because anything he uses is more of an organic feel. And then all of them can power up each other. And so I don't really actually know what's going on. I've just provided information. Then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of which I think is cool. And at least from my perspective, it's kind of like, I'm like, that's all great and cool. And I love all of these different things existing. But I have never once paused to be like, okay, but 16 billion years ago, how did the magic start? 
And maybe that's just who I am as a person of like how I interact with narratives that like the origin of the entire universe in a fictional world is not to me the most interesting part about a story. So while it is like an interesting fun fact to learn and it would be something cool to like learn about, it is not necessarily what I want to learn about in the middle of the narrative. You know what I mean? If Mm. that makes any sense. Are you sure, telling yeah. me that the person who does super sweethearts is more focused on the personal <laughs> relationships of individuals rather than the historical setting of all magic across all time? <laughs> like, I want to defend myself and be like, I do also care about like plot and stuff like that. <laughs> but <laughs> on a simplified version, yeah. I care about all these characters and them solving problems and being a weird little found family. And Vandal Savage is a cool character who I appreciate when he just shows up and does something like weird and inexplicable that all factors into his big plan. And I have never really cared about knowing what the whole big plan is. <laughs> Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm obviously, probably obviously I'm the opposite. So like having, ha- when you have the bonkers decades of comic history and you're like hey in this comic we're going to introduce these lords of order and lords of chaos oh, okay cool and then in this comic we're going to talk about this kind of magic and zatanna has been around forever and she does stuff by saying words backwards because that's a fun trick to do in comics right and then like you're getting all of this stuff all together and then you're trying to stick it into one world oh yeah and then also i don't know the marvels like what what's going on with that and then all these gods and then were the gods were they're not gods like uh hercules is running around somewhere yeah so like isis isis is is a thing right and so there's all of these gods all of this stuff all of this magic and then you have technology and the magic's supposed to be somehow rare difficult confuse like something to the point where it's not just how the universe works or how earth is built on like a techno magic <laughs> just basis because there's so much of it around all the time so for me i'm like okay how are you how are you doing this again like how is this all mashing together again how is it all supposed to make sense that you have martian sorcerers and also you know all the stuff going on on earth and where it's dr fate's deal why is it an onk all the time well we literally just had that interview with caleb talking about the magic and in in the dc universe too and it's this arc has got a lot going on in it um for magic and magic is one of those things too you deal in in role-playing games and comics and novels and stuff like your magic systems they matter like some people are like oh i don't care it's just magic magic can do whatever and i'm like okay well then if magic can do whatever then where's the tension of any plot if you don't put rules around it or you don't put guidelines around how it works and what it works and explain that to the person who's reading or watching, then you don't know where the where the limits are. Right. It's like the kids and the kids back in season one. Like, can you just create world peace? Like, how does this work? Right. <laughs> you know, she's like, that's that's not how any of this works. As long but as I say you it have, backwards, as long as I say world peace backwards, we're good. So. You've, you've got to set it up some kind of limitations, right? And we see Zatanna doing a bunch of amazing stuff. We see Zatara doing a bunch of stuff. And then Clarion shows up and he's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, just here, let me do that magic too, you know? And then just wrecks Zatanna with it. So there's there's different levels, there's different kinds, there's different access, right, to different magics. And most of the time, and it feels like to me, like, people don't bother to explain and that can be okay, but in a in the comics industry of DC Comics and the history of it, like if you don't explain the difference between you know what John Constantine is doing versus what Doctor Fate is doing versus what Swamp Thing is doing, then it starts to it starts to leak into each other too much to the point where it's hard to suspend your disbelief that anyone has any limits at all. So i i like I like the history bit. I like the implication yeah. there was another galaxy another universe before this universe and i i mean i like i like vandal more in young justice than i've ever liked vandal i don't think i needed to hear about his 300 days of being murdered over and over again with graphic detail so like that's i mean i get it that makes sense (laughs) it also feels rough 
this episode had some had some stuff in it I thought could have been left to implication. Yeah, I got notes on that. I I did just want to say about the magic thing though that I do think that the I want to say opening scene, but it's not the opening scene. It's the first scene that we get with all of the teen magic users does a really good job of very quickly establishing what all of them can do and like how Mm -hmm. Zatanna responds to all of them gives us a very clear idea of like, this is what they do uh, so that for the rest of this arc, we know we're like, oh, okay, that's how all of them work. This is why Mary can only do that. And this is what she's struggling with. And oh, that's how 13's magic works. And like, it's, a good little scene that very quickly introduces Agreed. three totally different forms of magic that are all totally different from Zatanna's other form of magic mm-hmm. and does it quickly enough that like you just get it and you're like, great, cool. I and, love like, how that leaves, was handled. It leaves some things open to interpretation and to questions of like, they just casually mention they're like, you're not using your urban magic enough 13. And you're like, what does that mean? But at the same time you get like, just a, a vibe from it of like, oh, I think I get what that means as an idea, but it also leaves it open to like mm-hmm. explore that and ask questions about that without you being like, I have no idea what any of these kids do. <laughs> uh, so I like it. It's a very good scene. I found I did find that really interesting. The whole take on Mary Marvel in general that she's talking about, like, I was too young and I couldn't do that. I wasn't I wasn't ready for this kind of power. But also the way that Zatanna is like, you're tapping into the ley lines of the planet, like you're tapping into this magic, but you're still thinking like, I tap into it to make myself and my body stronger, faster, better. But there are other things that you can do with it and stretch your imagination, right? But it's like Mary's trying to have those powers again, but under a limitation, like... And it's we'll like talk you have about that yeah later mm. yes for sure but I, I agree with you i like how all that was set up with with the all the different magic types yeah one of the and i don't know that i had thought of it as much now until now we're talking but i guess that's the whole point of the conversation but one of the things where it ties tickle and the helm together of like showing like these are both the anchors um, and these are the rules that we're operating under. And I think the idea of, you know, the phantom stranger showing up and be like, hey, remember, they're not following the rules anymore because there are two of them here. And ooh, that's not that's not balance um, because there's only one. and He's kind of a jerk and does whatever he wants under his own laws. So, um, hey, keep an, keep an eye out there, Vandal. But the idea that like, why does no one? I guess, why does no one just break the helm more? Also, why does no one just stop the cat more? But then, it's, I guess it's not as fun. But it just it ruins the plot if you just blow a cat up, I guess. Yeah. Also, it's blowing a cat up, even though it's definitely not a cat. We're going to get into all that later, this arc. <laughs> this, I'm sorry. This arc apparently makes me unhinged. I like it. I feel I feel a very weird vibe from myself, and it's just trying to make sense of this <laughs> arc. It's good timing because we're recording on Halloween, too. So there it is. There's a uh, oh. the taxi. The the cab has uh, is 1616 up on the top and the side. Um, so you got you got that one for you. So I actually have another 16 for you that I just I just stumbled on. So inside the muse, the, the jewelry store, it's a jewelry I think that's store. where she is. Right. Yeah. They've got this star of Atlantis. <laughs> and so I was like, I was like, are they talking about stone of Atlantis? Because that's like an actual type of stone that comes from the Dominican Republic. And so I looked up, and I was like, no, it's the star of Atlantis. And so I was doing some research on it, stumbled across the YJ wiki who made a really cool connection. So they, their, their speculation is that I'm um, literally reading it. The star of Atlantis is likely a reference to the Kulinin diamond, which is the largest gem quality round diamond ever found rough diamond ever found. The Kulinin diamond was 3,106 carats. The star of Atlantis, the sign apparently says it is 3,000 16 carats instead of 3106 carats so there was a 16 tucked into it's really hard to see on the thing on the sign but yeah well and the the sign itself also states um that it has it's beautiful and has a notable flaw one of the other things to think about is the if you wanted to like 
speculate a deeper connection. Um, uh-huh. One of the prevailing theories is that the cradle of humankind is found in Africa. So you have the star of Africa. So the cradle of all, um, uh, metahu- uh, you know, all metahumans theoretically from Vandal is also starts in Atlantis, the star of Atlantis. So just in the, pulling in the, random threads, though. And the star of Africa was carved from the colon and diamond. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I got you. I got you. I see what you're doing there. Nice. Y'all got a whole red string theory board going in the background. <laughs> just so we're happened. clear, the Cradle of Africa is found just outside of Johannesburg. So now you know. Nice. I have a, I have a map on my screen here. So Ma- maps maps are maps are good. Maps do things. You know what? You know what? I don't really need the excessively gory crime scene for me. I I just it's not for me. Yeah. What I will no, I get say. It. What I will say is that for me, I actually feel like seeing the gore in that scene doesn't do much for the actual storyline and doesn't give me more insight into Child. I personally think that Child saying, I wonder what these look like on the inside, which is a wild line and is intense and tells me like, oh, we're this is the energy of this character, followed by seeing the splatter of blood on the wall. And then if we later saw mm-hmm. just the group's reaction to an unseen atrocity would have almost, I think, kind of worked just as well, if not better, because it does the thing of like, you don't show the monster. It makes it almost scarier if you don't see the thing mm-hmm. without me having to stare at my screen for 20 seconds of just that's just some floating organs right there. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I think I think they could have done that scene without showing it and done, said implied that that had actually happened where Holly comes in and, and he's looking and he's like, this reminds me of <laughs> this reminds me of cutting up cadavers in medical school could have been creepy enough, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the extra details of the, the gore is not something that I'm a big, particularly good fan of either, particularly because I want to share the show with my kids, which I've said in the past. Right. So the first two seasons were rocking through. They're loving it. They just finished season one again. They watched it when they were younger, but they didn't fully register it. Now they're old enough. Yeah. And so we'll get to season two. And then now I have to figure out, OK, what am I curating at this yeah. stage? Because I do want them to have more of this, more of the story. And it's like I feel it's for me, it's one of those things where I love the idea that this show can be more mature. And I love the idea that animation can tell mature stories. I personally don't love the way that we, in a lot of media, categorize mature stories as violent stories. Yeah. Like, I think you can do all of the, like, adult emotional storytelling of this show without the the quote-unquote need for, like, intense blood and gore and violence. And it's the thing of, like, I don't think there is some sort of, like, moral problem with showing violence on television it's just not necessarily what i want out of a story like this so when it's a story that i love and appreciate and have watched so many seasons of when we get into these later seasons where there is an uptick in the violence i'm like eh, it eh, i don't love it um i can get through it and i can move on past it and i don't think it ruins anything but there is a part of me that's like in some alternate universe there's a version of this episode where there are not right. bones and organs floating in the air, and I probably right. have a slightly better time with it. <laughs> Neil, uh, you, we've gotten our two inputs. Oh, it doesn't bother me uh, at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. I knew it. I knew but, it. I knew it. I knew it didn't. We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've talked about this before. But I was trying to think about. But I was trying to think about it more in the light of like. So I watched Invincible, um, and in the first episode, there's a pretty hard turn of like oh okay this you know this is a cartoon like i know it's you know i see the rating i you know i I know what i might be oh no this is violent beyond reasons but then like that maintains like then that's about the show like the the way that they fight is violent they violently fight and what you had in this episode was but at that yeah we're fighting goblins we cool magic we're riding on carousel okay wait a minute there's just gore everywhere mid episode miss miss yeah so that punch is a little harder in the same way that like so i don't know 
for anyone that's watching uh, Loki season two. I will not ruin anything in the sense that like the off screenness of some pretty horrific yeah. things happens and it's just implied and you have a character enter and the implication is they're seeing something horrific. It's funny you mentioned that because it's exactly what I was thinking when I was watching. Yeah. Uh, the, I think I've caught up on the current episodes of Loki, and there's some there's, there's some the pretty stuff. Like I don't, I was like, please I don't, please don't turn this episode. camera. <laughs> I no, haven't no, seen okay. the latest yeah. episode, so this is well, but, a wild but, but, thing for folks to be saying. Yeah, well, but she, so it's it. There's definitely like warning. there's definitely moments of like, please don't turn that camera. I don't need to see whatever's happening. Whatever they're looking at, their faces are enough. I don't need to don't turn that camera, and they don't. And I think that it, I think that it works better. And if if I was going to get hit with something like out of left field like that, that hasn't been in the show in the past and, and things like that, then I probably I, I there's there's definitely a non zero percent chance that I would have stopped watching because I don't I don't want to be jumped and surprised by something. I, I like the consistency. Yeah. And we talked about this a little last season, too, with like cyborgs, cyborgs accident. It was it was horrifying. And anatomically fairly correct in all of the insides of him that we got to see and i'm like and also i don't think i needed that so just choices or halo's halo's multiple deaths you know things like that this time through one of the things i did notice with this scene that also threw me in this conversation that threw me for a loop related to this conversation is how we have them enter this extremely violent scene that is just wild to witness even within like the upped violence of these later seasons and then mary responds to this uh crime scene by saying holy moly because <laughs> intense ultra violence is fine but you can't let the teenagers swear <laughs> but see but see i loved that i loved it because it was an absolute 100 percent callback to who she used to be like that's just who she used to be almost so made react <laughs> funnier by the fact that she like two minutes later does swear in this episode but just yeah. it knowing that the scene was coming kind of thing <laughs> this time this time through like i'm paying attention to everything else and i am less fully thrown by floating skeleton uh and so i just noticed that she, that's what she says and i'm like holy moly what <laughs> that's, that's the, that's no it, one's it reaction actually, it actually it actually made me uh, because I knew what they were walking in on, too. I think it made me kind of laugh a little, which took a little bit of the pressure off a little bit. Plus, I also <laughs> knew it was coming. It was I knew it was coming this time. So then I was like, OK, I, it's not a big surprise. Like a left turn like Neil's talking about. Well, and I mean, to their credit, they blow, they blow up the situation literally. Also, it, I feel like being a stickler just to, because it's humorous to me. Technically, no one breaks in. Nobody breaks into this jewelry store. There are no alarms because no one breaks in. Child casually well, phases through the, the window. The power is out, everyone, I No, but everyone... No, the power is back on by then because they, when they go to Madame Xanadu, they, the power is okay, back on. Okay, no, I take it back. You're right. No, please continue with what you were actually trying to say. I apologize for interrupting. No, but the idea that like everyone just portals in. The security guard clearly didn't have an opportunity to hit any buttons. Um, and so just, and clearly no one's walking down the street other than this bus full of children. So it's just a weird concept to me that like, that's just there and was there for who knows how long, all of it. But also Neil, I'm not sure magical teleportation is going to hold up in court for, we didn't break in. We magically Nobody teleported broke in. in. I don't think any any judge would be like, well, you got me there. <laughs> like, well, all right, write that down. We've got to write some new laws. Got it. <laughs> That's season five. What does the legal system look like on Earth 16? So we get a lot of pop culture references as well as magical spells um, that, of course, have been translated. The first one is Tragawags emerge under a glamour. I also think it's like really interesting to do all of that in such a seemingly active area in Manhattan because mm -hmm. uh, there are definitely people from start to finish. You are literally bumped into by Henry Fife, who apparently loves Superman and staring at devices. <laughs> <laughs> Two character traits. Yes. OK, sure. They're not there. But like, what does like what does this glamour entail? Like, does it entail like not seeing the streetlight bent over, not seeing the like the fire hydrant shoot out, the lines on the street fly up, this tree grow everywhere. Like, 
Is it just covering all of it until you're done and then it's okay? Neil, I will point out, this is New York City. You know how much stuff people just don't question? True, especially especially <laughs> in the world where superheroes are everywhere. I mean, I, why you, and you, counterpoint is now established for me. Why use the glamour? Who cares? Yeah, why even bother? Thing. Yeah. What a waste. I, I just keep picturing that the voice in my head of the guy from um, Across the Spider-Verse. I think it's a Banksy, you know, like just <laughs> oh, like yeah. artwork, artwork, just like bent stuff everywhere. <laughs> uh, what do we have? So we have boxes combined when they get put together. Tragawogs return to the earth. Glamour vanish. Restore nature when she fixes the tree. Fly my pretties, which is obviously a Wizard of Oz yeah. reference um, mm-hmm. when they when they set sail. There are so many references because also I... Mr. Tani, I choose you, like, screams Pokemon. Also, can we talk about, hey, Rich, can you tell me about Mr. Tani, the, like, human tiger thing from 1947, please? Yes, yes, that's where Mr. Tani comes from. Mr. Tani, Mr. Tani was literally, I think, I didn't I talk about that? Oh, you know what? I think uh, Chris and I, Chris Newton and I talked about it in the uh, Shazam two-part discussion session. But yeah, Mr. Tani, I think I'll call him Mr. Tani, uh, comes from a humanoid tiger, randomly humanoid, sapient tiger that used to wear like a suit and a cane. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, from back in the day. The old business uh, tiger. Go old on. business tiger. Well, I mean, you know, you've got Shazam. No who's fancy got cap- socialite tiger. <laughs> right. He's, he's passing as human. No one will know. Yeah. Captain Marvel, who's, you know, has all of these powers of the gods fighting a worm named Mr. Mind is one of his major villains. Like, it's just a very strange time <laughs> in that early days of, of the Shazam life. Yeah. So, and also, and Mr. Tawny must still be around. I mean, been around long enough for Mary to make references to him. Wait a minute. How old is Billy? How old would Billy be so at Billy this point? Billy is nine in season one, and it has been 10 years. He's nine in ten. season He's one? He's 10. He's, He's 10. 10. Then, yeah. then uh he's 20 in season four it's been 10 years. right that's right it's been 10 years total right because it was a five and a two. okay gotcha so he's so he's 20 so because well, Mary... remember last season he's in the truck and it <laughs> Shazam, that's right that's right so he must have been right 18 i think 18 in 18 the truck. 19 yeah something like that yeah because i remember for Wally in the season one, we were just watching it where he was talking at the end of season one. He says, I just think it's funny. There's a 10 year old on the team. Yeah, and Rockets yeah. all there it is. <laughs> I was crossing that over with uh, you inducted Robin into crime fighting at the ripe old it, age of nine. Age of nine. Yes, absolutely. And also they name that's when it's the Cobra and Enhan- Cobra Venom enhanced one. They name it Mr. Tawny. I'll call him Mr. Tawny. Yeah. When I, I, I started laughing when I heard that. One of my notes is just, I love the implication that Mr. Tawny is in some way still a part of the Marvel family to some extent that Mary has knows something about the fact that Billy adopted a tiger one time. Because we never hear about Mr. Tawny in the previous seasons. Um, And I just like, I like the idea that he's just still around. (laughs) He's everybody's friend. Superboy gets a wolf. Billy got a tiger. I like to think that Mr. Tani, that that the uh, the Cobra Venom continued to uh, evolve him into now he walks around like he's a humanoid walking around Season and talking seven. to them. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. All right. Enough of Mr. Tani. I choose you. We also get a Mary Poppins reference. It's just nonstop. Also, we do not we do not say Marvel anymore. Apparently that I remembered in hindsight that became a thing. We don't say that. Yeah, that's became a thing. Stuff. We also can't say yeah. Shazam for obvious reasons. Um, because, well, I have the power. Oh, nope. Uh, I have the power of someone. Take your guess. I have the power of several letters in an order. That can we she don't spell it? That's say. the question. <laughs> that was sorry. I was thinking. Uh, could a person use sign language? That is a good question. I like this. <laughs> uh, what else did I have? Oh yeah, Father, guide my journey through fate's holy onk. Um, is when she's about to <laughs> send Clarion back to the tower, yeah. which took <laughs> it took yep, me sixteen took days. 16 days. <laughs> um, and then Shield, and the other pop culture reference, which I assume is you don't. We were was it? You want my power? You can't handle my power. I'm like, is that you want the truth? 
You can't handle the truth. I don't know if that's what that was going for. Oh, that's totally what that was going for. I do like that that has been a consistent thing with a lot of Zat- a lot of Zatanna's spells. If you reverse them, are like common phrases or quotes from things that I like. That that's like her like fire spell that she uses most of the time is uh, fire burn and cauldron bubble, but reversed and stuff like that. And I like that it because Zatanna's part of a performing arts family. Like I li- I like that idea that that stuff is just encoded enough into her brain that that's how she's going to think of spells off the top of her head. It's a nice little detail. Then the other big one I have is uh, the Saturn girl and chameleon boy are sitting on the same place where Jefferson and Jace were um, outside to the point where I pulled them both up. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways to save money in animation is to have that the background be static. So it's, it's an image that you're putting other images over the top of. That is the case here where they are identical. Um, they've changed like the effect of like how much sun there is. But other than that, they've just placed these two characters where the other two were. So which totally works again. It I don't have a lot of follow up answers. I feel like they were there when it had come out, but I wasn't able to track them back down of, okay, how did they get back there? And how did why when is and what they seem very unconcerned about the things that have happened thus far. Uh, And I feel like they got a lot of work to do and you're just watching TV. So we'll get to it. Chowing on chicky (laughs) winsies. Yep. 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 Also, Jace did nothing wrong. She's clearly only working with people that are volunteers. They're not being coerced in any way. We've been told that she's taking. She's, she's taking care of him exactly. like a mother. <laughs> and uh, cut Neil off from his pro Jace soapbox. Neil, edit that out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think my my last note here is I. The moment where Clarion appears in the uh, jewelry store and both him and Zatanna shout, what did you do at the top of their lungs is my favorite energy for Zatanna and Clarion. And of all of the things that happen in this arc, I do like the reinforcement of this dynamic between these two characters that just like they have been fighting for 10 years and Zatanna is tired and Clarion is also kind of tired. And this is just where yeah. these two characters exist together. And I like this kind of hilarious antagonism between these these two magic users. It's fun. Well, you gotta love the feather in the cap of Zatanna to say, in this span of time, I have managed to just really annoy this being that is both immortal and been on this <laughs> earth for thousands of years. And I am yeah. a total pain. <laughs> Just a total pain for that one. <laughs> it's the true, true absolutely Dan energy. I, I, as kind of a, I guess, if when you were talking about that, one of the things I flashed back to was one of the moments that I actually liked was when Clarion bows out of the Zoom call. Yeah, it's and good. and 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 Vandal's like, that cannot be good. N- none, none of whatever that was is good like you could see it on his face where um what's his name bizovi is like oh our friend is a little bit excitable or whatever nonsense he says and vandal's like yeah no no, this is not he's not i don't know i don't know what's going on there but i feel like i need to know now (laughs) what's going on there so i like that i like that moment and with that moment, I also like we we joked that it's the Zoom meeting of the light because it is. Uh, and Clarion's the guy who has his cat on screen the entire Zoom meeting. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that one. There's always that person. Yeah, it's it's correct video call edi- etiquette. <laughs> if you have the cat, right. we need to see the cat. Please show me the cat um, right. and tell it or that the- I love it. Okay wild wild theory and i don't think it's true but i'd like to say it out loud um when he says teakle tell them what's going on van can yeah. vandal understand teakle <laughs> is that why he's so aware of what's wrong i don't think that's true but like it just came to my mind of like i, I don't know after all these thousands of years like it's it's not impossible 
that that could be true. I just find it improbable. Yes. Yes. I 100% believe that Tickle, uh did explain when she oh, meowed, yeah. uh, but I also fully believe that no one understood her but Clarion. <laughs> She's a good evil cat, and I love her with my whole heart. <laughs> <laughs> the true cat person experience is the show tells me that cat's evil, and I'm still like, nah, man, I would like to give her a pat on the head. She deserves a treat. Yeah. The whole fight, she was calmly sitting on the stairs. She's just going to chill over there. Just living cat life. Well, that, that's all the aster I have. Yeah, I think that I think that's it for me, too. We just need, we're going to get a lot more history of Tracy and Mary and how that. And I've also got a lot in crashing the mode. Like, my notes are brief because my crashing the mode is not. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative writing process from the episodes we review. And today we're going to be talking about making memorable magic. It's just because I love alliteration. One of the big things about magic kind of falls into the same realm as technology, as time travel. But one of the key pieces is that whatever rules you establish, you just follow them. It maintains the internal logic. That doesn't mean you have to define every aspect of magic which you can clearly see from these episodes, even from the earliest days of season one and the introduction of magic and the questioning nature that Wally has. But even now with the definition, and you can hear earlier in the episode, just the variety of ways that a person could interact with magic or present magic in this world, not only answers questions, but introduces more questions that could have answers. And that's how you keep someone engaged with this process is that not only are they having their questions answered, but they are having more that they would want answered. And they don't they go left unanswered because it is essentially a world where, you know, we're not going to go to magic class. Uh, we, we could and that can certainly be fun. But the idea that these things are just happening naturally and some are less natural. There's this studying, there's these proteges, there's all of these different versions. But one of the other things that this does is it shows and doesn't tell, which you can see from the very first instance of things that the episode does is it shows instead of just telling. It does a bit of both, but one of the big things about that first scene is that you're shown these different versions of magic these different people interacting with it, these different people doing different things with the magic. And it's interacting directly with the world itself, which starts defining things and again, answering questions while presenting new ones. Ley lines, nature magic, urban magic, backwards magic, baby magic, Latin, all of these different languages and versions and everything you can think of is presented as naturally as anything else that we've seen thus far. And because of that character interaction, both positive, negative, and everything in between, because one of the other big things about magic is that there's consequences and conflicts. I mean, one of the largest conflicts is certainly law and order, but just the idea of how a person could not just use magic, but the use of magic and their choices in their use of magic. And the final piece that is presented throughout this arc, throughout this season, throughout this entire show, is that one of the biggest things is evolution and learning. If you simply present magic as one way and then it is forever that way, there's something lost. I mean, one of the biggest things I, I feel personally about magic once it's introduced into a narrative is that there needs to be more. There's that next level or there's that reason why or there's that consequence that wasn't understood until now or in spite of the consequences, these are the things that we're still needing to sacrifice or needing to do or there's lines we won't cross because of the consequences that are associated with it. And it's that evolution and learning. And, you know, we have a direct correlation with that because we're raising these new magic users up. So all of that to say. The quick, the quick hits are define the rules, show, don't tell, integrate magic with the world directly, character interaction with magic, balance mystery with understanding, have consequences and conflicts, and 
always evolve and learn. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. So, what a Emily. ridiculous speculation on our part, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> so, this just, there's a lot set up in this episode for later stuff both in the flashbacks and everything else but i'll let other people who care about vandal savage and his flashbacks talk about those <laughs> Rewatching this episode knowing everything that happens later in the arc one of the things that i was thinking about a lot is how later in this arc we're gonna have zatanna quote unquote mess up her conversation with mary which sends mary storming off and everything that that implies for what may happen in the future and all the conversations that then sprung up in reviews and discussion of the show about Zatanna and whether or not she is the most manipulative character in the DC universe or whatever <laughs> like there was much discussion of Zatanna's eventual plan and everything, but rewatching it and seeing that opening bit with her protégés and seeing how this first thing we see with Zatanna is her giving all of them what is essentially constructive criticism. Like Zatanna is not necessarily wrong in that scene, but the fact that it just seemingly immediately demoralizes them and being like, I feel like that is foreshadowing that I feel like you only kind of realize on rewatches of like, Zatanna is not always perfect at how she is discussing things with this group. Zatanna is not necessarily wired to be the kind of like cuddly pat on the head teacher that these kids maybe need a little bit more of, which I think then sets up for later when she fumbles everything in a moment of stress and may or may not set up a character to go, you know, join Apocalypse and take over the world. Um <laughs> and like i just i just think it's interesting and seeing that scene of how everything she tells them is constructive criticism about that what they have to work on but like the idea that she says all of that first and then at the end is like but you're all great is like that's not the thing they're gonna remember they're all gonna remember how these are all the things you messed up kids um and all of that and it's just interesting on a rewatch seeing that and noticing that because the first time through that you're watching it, not knowing where all of that is going to lead, you're like, oh, OK, I find that interesting. Because, again, I care about mm -hmm. how everyone I mean, interacts. You have, you have someone in their, you have someone in their mid 20s taking under three protégés using three different kinds of magic that she now wants to establish as potentially being the oh, yeah, we're in crashing mode. I got so scared. We're in crashing the mode. I can say what I, what I want now. But setting them up to be taking over the helmet of fate, uh, you know, the thing that we just established yeah. kind of showed up and the whole thing kicks back to 16 billion years ago. But I think it's important. Like her messing up makes everything. I mean, again, you don't have that discourse if no one cares. You don't have that discourse if no one yeah. has a debate as to whether or not she did or didn't. I don't know how I don't know where I fall. I, I don't know that I would. I don't think she manipulated them that far because I still feel like ultimately it's their choice in the end but yes so two th two things on that I also want to add that you saying that how she is really young and is taking on all these protégés I think the one thing that also I found interesting thinking about this again is the fact that Zatanna is largely self-taught like it's the thing of like in season one, we see that she has learned some stuff, but is is quote unquote nowhere near the level of Z Z Zatara. Sorry, uh, that she is quote unquote nowhere near the level of Zatara, and like there is the implication that her father is very protective of her and has not. I I think it is kind of implied that he doesn't teach Zatanna as much as he could. That like that is something he kind of wants to keep her out of. Like he won't let her join the team. He won't let her get more training. And then he becomes Dr. Fate. She's left on her own. She doesn't have any parents. She's now being raised by a robot and a black canary and Batman in a cave. <laughs> and the idea of Zatanna having over the course of like between season one and season two gains so much power and so much skill that I think she has to, because there aren't that many magical heroes around, 
has kind of just had to figure out. And then you put her now, 10 years later, in this thing of like, teach ch children how to do that thing that you just had to figure out. Teach children who do it completely differently than you how to do yeah. a thing that you stumbled your way through, through cause and effect and error after error, and are now one of the most powerful magicians in the world. Just figure mm -hmm. that out. And it's like, that's wild that all of that pressure is seemingly put on her. Of course she messes it up Teach sometimes. Teach children how to take some yeah. of the strongest power in the universe and use it responsibly. <laughs> and it's even... Sorry, I just, I'm thinking about this a lot because I love Zatanna and I find this interesting. And like after this season came out, I even, I think it was during the mid-season break for this season, I did a rewatch of season one. And one of the things that stood out to me is it's Halloween, we'll bring it up, in secret in that, in the Halloween episode from season one, there is the moment where Zatanna notices Connor and Megan uh, being all flirty and just goes, oh, how long have Connor and Megan been a couple? And Z Artemis reacts the way that we know that she does uh, and is very uncomfortable with this. And Zatanna's immediate response is to say, oh, I'm sorry. I just thought it seemed so obvious. Wait, where are you going with There's the dance? Like she fully fumbles that too. Like sees Artemis get upset and just goes, it's so obvious though that they're dating. Like, no tact kind of thing that gets brushed past and we move on because it's a fun episode and everything. But like, it's one of those things of like, we've established that for as charismatic and charming as Zatanna is, and as much as we love her, she fumbles conversation sometimes when it is dealing with like, person being sensitive and upset about a thing. And I just think it's really interesting seeing how it unfolds in this arc. And seeing that, like, that was something I hadn't noticed until I, like, went back and rewatched that episode after seeing this arc and was like, the seeds are there. <laughs> Zatanna messes up sometimes, guys. Well, I mean, Zatara is protective. So <laughs> who knows, like, um, how much, you know, interaction that she's gotten with other people and, like, how that is or how her childhood went. I don't know. And then he was gone. And then suddenly she was in, you know, in the team. So, I mean, I fumbled all kinds of social interactions for many years. Sure. Yeah. Many years saying all the wrong things. Oh, all the yeah. wrong people. I, I mean, the um, day's young for me. I got a couple more shots to do it today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're all doing our best and learning as we go. But like, yeah. And and you know I look at that scene and I'm like I never I didn't think she was being overly critical of them at no, all. She no. was, especially in a in a post training scenario of like, well, we just went through training. Yeah. Here's some thoughts. <laughs> here's the three. Here's the three that y you left. You left three of them, and also there's some chaos that needs to be cleaned up. Like it's very it's very much like that season one scene from like downtime where Batman just kind of lines everybody up and is like. You did everything wrong. Now go take a shower, you <laughs> chaos gremlins. <laughs> like, I also, uh, for crashing the mode, it is confirmed later in this arc that the moment when Zatanna says that they're her best students is, according to the universe, the exact moment that the idea of sharing the helmet occurs to her and thus sets off the chaos of this arc because apparently that one thought <laughs> tips the entire balance of chaos and order and sets child having to come to earth because that's the thing that they keep mentioning throughout this episode and into the next of like oh the the because clarion and i think it's in next episode that clarion and child refer to it as the other side's new plan and stuff like that like they have become aware of been made aware of this and like that's the thing that tips everything off. So it became, again, a discussion when these episodes were coming out and that eventually gets brought up of like, how long was Zatanna planning this? Is she the master manipulator of, of the Young Justice universe? It's like, no, canonically, that is the exact moment that this idea occurs to her and sets everything off balance, apparently, according to the Chaos Lords and Lords of Order. 
And that's the thing to think about, like, how is it setting it off? It's not that like there's two Dr. Fates. It's like there's three separate ones. They can only be one at a time. So how is that setting off the balance, you know? Yeah, but you changed, but you changed everything because the whole the whole counterbalance with the, the Lord of Chaos is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was too busy messing with hummingbirds. So, and, and if you mess with my cat, I disappear. I think that's your counterbalance is just chaos. So the if you just start adding in more power through more avenues for Dr. Fate to utilize and is it and is part of that her idea that maybe Mary could take it over because that's a game changer beyond the uh, the rest of them beyond who has it now. Like, you want to tell me she's going to say Shazam and then don the helmet of fate? And then that's what's flying around everywhere? I'm going to send another Lord of Chaos. I got yeah. I got issues with this. Please don't do that. You know what? You're not wrong. It's definitely the it's definitely given given Superman a, a, a yeah. Green Lantern ring, you know, kind of situation, you know, like, yeah, I get you. I get you. I see that. Uh, anything else? Any other crash in the mode uh, business? No, I'm going to wait. Oh, you know what we forgot? Hashtag Beast Boy's a mess. Beast Boy's not okay. Also, school bus. School bus. Keep, yeah. keep an eye on the school bus. The other one I think the other one I think will wait is it, it gets more, but um Madame Xanadu has has some stuff going on. Yeah. Mm. Um and I I think that conversation yeah. works better um once we see a little bit more of the things she can do. <laughs> you know, the other thing too is like every time every time Blue Devil shows up. I'm just like, man, we get nothing. We get nothing for <laughs> we get nothing for him. He's just like here. he's he's like, oh, and you're like, oh, okay, so this is the mystic yep. version of Blue Devil. Okay, cool. There's like a whole thing about how he went from a tech hero to like a mid magic hero that's really wild and messed up. But I guess this is the magic version. Okay. And he's taking care of people. He didn't I don't know what's happening with Blue Devil. And I think it's really funny that he even got a voice. But okay. Interesting. He's got to check in on his kids. He's the current den mother. <laughs> Checking in. Should I? Should I be worried? No, I'm good. Okay, cool. That's how I talk to my kids. Should I be worried? No. Uh, okay, great. Thanks. The, am- the amount to which every person fumbles Beast Boy's problems. The first thing I was thinking of was Blue Devil should be like immediately on the phone with Black and Aaron. <laughs> right? Get in the elevator. Yeah. I feel like. I yeah. feel like Red Tornado would have called Black Canary immediately. <laughs> Red Tornado would have called Beast Boy out on his nonsense. I That's do not what, understand the happened. interactions of this child. I need assistance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. He is clearly not okay, but stating he is okay. So please come and correct his malfunction. There was a there was a level of, of nonsense in the cave that Red Tornado would simply walk away from, but I feel like this would not be it. No. All right. I think we're good with all that. I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, right. stay whelmed, everyone. Stay whelmed, everyone. <laughs> everyone. Everybody. That's, we're going to miss it every time. We just need every it time. for closure. I don't even know if we use those in every episode. Oh, we, do. we just personally need it for closure. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. 
as such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.